So it's been a couple of days since uh, I started playing around with this. Uh, let's see what happens first of all, just to bring ourselves back on track. What happens when I press reset now? Uh, by the way, Benny's decided to join us again because he also is interested not only about just about Bluetooth, but about stepper motors as well. That was him operating the camera there. You see, he's a multi-talented cat, I tell you. Right, pressing reset. What happens? The pointer, nicely shaped now, you notice. It's gone back to the known reference point, which is zero, or thereabouts. And now it goes back to whatever the temperature in this room. And for some reason, it, it seems to think it's 28 degrees in this room, which, quite frankly, I'd be surprised. Now, Benny's purring so loudly, that I'm sure the microphone must be picking him up. So we're gonna have a tiny little break until Benny's calmed down a bit, and, oh, and then we'll carry on. Is that all right, Benny? Yeah, Benny says that's fine. <laughs> you should be looking in the other way, Benny, at the camera. Okay, we'll just have a little break until Benny's calmed down, and then I can continue properly to describe exactly how all this hangs together. Okay, Benny settled down, so let's carry on with our description of what's uh, happened so far. Now, you saw that when I pressed the uh, reset button, the first thing this pointer did was to move back to what was considered a known position. And how does it know that it's a known position? Well, yes, you've guessed it. It's that micro switch at the top here. So the known position is uh, generated by this little micro switch that uh, is now at the top of the wheel. So when the wheel revolves initially, as you can see, it's going to go back anti-clockwise until it makes a connection. And the instant it makes that connection, the pointer stops, sets the known position to zero, and that's how we know where we are. Now, um, I've had a bit of fun in games uh, connecting all this up. As you can see, I've changed from the, uh, the Uno clone to a, a Nano now. And I did decide uh, to go for the big board, simply because it was just a little bit easier to handle, really, and I wasn't uh, short of space. I did try that little tiny driver. It worked exactly the same ways, and it even had LEDs on it. Ooh, a bit like that. Um, but very small, um, surface-mounted ones, basically. Oh, yeah, exactly, Benny. Surface-mounted devices. So it was basically a miniature version of this. Uh, now, the reason why these lights keep going on and off is because underneath this Nano, which I'm going to have to show you, there is in fact a DS18B20 temperature sensor, which I've described in some detail in my previous video. And you can watch that and find out everything there is to know about the DS18B20. that uses the one-wire system. Well, two wires, really. I mean, you've got to have two, haven't you? Um, but it is so very simple to use, especially when you use the, um, the library that I use as well, the Dallas Temperature Library. It really is a doll to use. So I thought, well, might as well follow my own example. So I've used that temperature sensor under there, and you won't be able to see it, not even if I zoom in closely, I don't suppose, for a second. Um, because it's hidden. I'll show you in a minute. So this is reading the temperature and working out then what the scale is that it's got to convert the temperature. Say the temperature is anything between 0 and 30 degrees uh, centigrade. Now, if you're living in a part of the world where centigrade is not normally used, you're, living, uh, you're using temperatures that uh, are worked out in Fahrenheit, then you're on your own. No, I'm just kidding. Here's the temperature scale that I'll be using on screen now. Zero, just so you can remember while we're talking about this, is when water freezes, that's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is currently showing about 30 degrees in this office. I have doubts about that. I think I'd be sweating profusely if it was 30 degrees. It probably is about 25 though, 26. Which is probably, I don't know, I haven't got the faintest idea what that is in Fahrenheit until the chart is shown on the screen, but you'll be able to read that off. It's pretty warm though. You're probably more interested in how all this bit's connected together. So let's have a look at the code and see how the electronics matches with the actual electronics. Right, things of interest to note then. Um, here are our um, libraries that we've included. The Axel stepper, which we spoke about previously. The one wire, 
and the Dallas temperature wire. These are described in the previous video when I talked about the DS18B20, so you can have a look at that. Um, I also mentioned that we are using half step here for this motor because it just works so much better. It's a lot smoother. The standard stepper motor that comes with the Arduino is full step, which means you get a far rougher um, graduation of this. And of course, you don't get any acceleration. If you just look again at what happens when I press the reset on here, you'll see that it starts smoothly, speeds up, and then slows down towards the end of it. Well, there it didn't because it hit the switch. But it starts and it goes and it slows and it stops. So that's the acceleration and deacceleration that this um, Axel stepper gives you. And the half step mode is what it uses. So there we have all our definitions for the pins. As I say, this is a five wire motor, five wires, which makes it a, a unipolar motor. All five wires are unipolar. So here's some information about the temperature. And then we have the setup. Now half of this setup is all to do with the temperature. Half of it's to do with what the motor can do, the maximum speed it can go to and so forth. That's pretty easy to follow, I think. Um, this is how we get to our known reference point. So basically when the motor starts up, it turns in an anti-clockwise manner until that little brass um, lever I've got on here touches the micro switch and then it knows it's got to that point. Otherwise it would never know where this pointer is pointing to initially when you switch it on. Um, now what else? Right, so once it reaches the re reference point, now one of the really good things about this, you see this disable outputs. Before I had that line of code in here and its corresponding partner enable outputs, which I think I must have up here, here we are, enable outputs. What happens by default with stepper motors is that when they've reached the required movement, the required position, then the motor is held in position with the current still flowing and you'll see it by these LEDs still being on. Now what the library we've got here enables is that it turns all these um, inputs low and therefore turns off all the motors uh, on here, all the windings anyway on here. And although you've got two windings, there's a centre tap to each one, which I have a, a rather nifty picture of. Let me just switch to my monitor. Here we are. Now, what this shows us is how the windings are configured um, for this particular motor. As I say, it's a unipolar. So we've got half a winding here, half a winding here with a centre tap that goes to positive, And it's repeated here as well. So the red positive power comes in and it either gets switched to here or sunk, I should say, or here. And at the same time, it can be sunk here and or here. And this little table shows you what's happening. But as a very simple example, the power gets switched on. It first goes to uh, number one, which is here. Then it goes to number one and number two. Then it just goes to number two, then two and three back here, then three and four, then finally just four. And that makes it all very smooth and reasonably talky. So when the power gets switched off to save, well, not just energy, but the fact that this motor well, nearly melted, frankly, when I left it on for only more than about 10 minutes, it got so hot, it was too hot to touch. You couldn't touch it without getting burnt. And of course, I had it on this green uh, mat. I was actually quite worried it was going to melt the mat. It really was that hot. And I measured the current and there's about uh, 400 milliamps throwing through this motor when it was at standstill. When it runs, there's about 300 milliamps running in total. So those 400 milliamps might even have been 450. Um, when it's sitting there doing nothing all the time, that's, that's just ridiculous. So this library uh, that we're using allows us to enable the outputs when we want to move the motor and then disable the outputs when we're happy that uh, the motor's stopped for a while. Now, of course, that's fine in stopping this thing bursting into flames or otherwise dying on us prematurely due to the heat. And I, believe me, I think it would have done. Also, if you have to be using battery-powered equipment, 
it's absolutely essential I think that you can turn off the motor in its entirety and the fact that these lights are all off now shows that no windings are actually being supplied power. Without those commands in one or more of these LEDs would stay on depending on which phase I suppose it got to. Now the downside is that without any power on this motor at all you can gently turn the motor gently very gently in fact it's resisting quite a bit and i'm not surprised because it is a ratio of about 64 to 1 so for every one turn here 64 turns are happening in the motor and even though if i really do push it it's moving i'm not convinced actually it's not just slipping inside anyway now that i've moved it of course it's pointing to entirely the wrong thing um, the arduino has no idea that i've moved this motor so we're going to have to reset it back to the known zero point again. And off it goes until it finally finds that micro switch. There it does. And now it moves itself to the correct temperature. And the power's running because the LED is wrong. And now it's stopped. So that is an absolute godsend, the fact we can disable the output. So let's have a look at the main loop then. The loop, as it says here, these are the four things it does. It gets the temperature and remembers it moves the pointer to the new temperature value, and I'm only working in whole degrees here, not half or quarter degrees, that would be a bit ridiculous on a temperature scale like this. Um, and just repeat that. Now just to show you what happens, I've also allowed serial monitor inputs if nothing's happening. So like now, it's all gone a bit dead, hasn't it? So I can go to the serial monitor and type in an arbitrary value. So if I type in here, now I'm going to type in 10 there in the serial window. As you can see, it's now going to move to roughly point 10. I'll say roughly, it's wherever it thinks 10 is. Now, how do we get that mapping working? Well, if we look in the code, I've got a little routine down the bottom. It says map temp to pos, temp being temperature, not temporary. So basically, we set this map command. It's built into Arduino. Might even be built into C++, actually. We say, here's the value I've got, and I want, I'm taking five degrees off this, because as I say, I'm not believing this temperature at the moment. It could be true, but just for the purpose of this, I'm taking five off. Now I'm saying, the temperature range I'm expecting in is minus five to plus 30, and that's got to fit into between zero and 1024. 1024 being roughly a, a quarter circle 90 degrees on this motor um, and that's, that's all that does really there's a bit of debugging and turns it back so the input is between minus 5 and 30 degrees right on the temperature sensor under here and it's going to return a value somewhere between 0 and 1024 scaled so that it fits in to this value here let me show you let me disconnect this and show you the temperature sensor underneath here and move back to my workbench um, because it's it's all fairly simple, isn't it? We've got four wires here coming into the um, the controller. Um, the actual motor plugs into that controller anyway. There's nothing to do with that. There's power supplied to this board via this 9 volts. So that means I can now whoops, disconnect that. I've also pressed reset as well. Um, so that this 9 volt is going into the V-in on the nano here. And... That supplies, of course, both the nano and the board, and in fact, the uh, temperature sensor as well. Oh, Benny, you've come to look at some stepper motor information. Excellent. Well, you looked at the last one. I don't see why you shouldn't look at this. Yes, here he is. Look, inspecting my handiwork and give me some marks. Excellent. Well, if you'd just like to wander off over to the, over to the windowsill, we'll um, crack on and I'll show our viewers the temperature sensor underneath. So if I disconnect the power, just, just ignore Benny for the time being, he'll get bored in a minute. And I unplug my nano from the board here. There's the temperature sensor underneath. And that's a DS18B20. Um, one wire, it's called, um, although it uses two, confusingly. Um, but it only uses two for as many temperature sensors as you want. That's pretty good. Um, and that feeds into the digital pin right at the top, which is D10, I believe. Let me just have a very close look. Uh, D12. 
So plug that back in again. There we are. All right. So that's all there is. And it says there's temperature sensor under temperature sensor underneath the nano itself. That supplies the four wires into the stepper motor controller. Um, power is supplied in on the nine volts. Um, and by the way, I tried running this on five volts. So that that motor says it can be five volt, five to twelve volts. At five volts, it didn't have any power at all, no torque to speak of, not even at full power. So I very much doubt you're going to run it on five volts. Nine is pretty good. When that's moving at nine volts, I can't really stop it. I mean, not that I'm going to break it, but it had a fair amount of force on there. And at 12 volts, I suspect it will it will be even stronger. Well, it most definitely will be. So, uh, thanks, Benny. Um, the power from here then is supplied by this little one here to the board and the negative comes from underneath. So that's supplied independently now of my five to 12 volts on here. And that's all there is to it. That's the motor output. Um, caveats, you must get these in the right way around. As you can see, I've made myself a four way header here. Um, you can use individual cables, of course, just neater having a four. If you get these the wrong way around, so that way, instead of that way, um, you'll find your motor runs backwards. But that's about it, really. That should be pretty obvious. In fact, you may want your motor to run backwards. Normally, the, the normal travel on this motor is, in fact, anti-clockwise on this board, so it goes around like that. Well, I don't want it to do that. I want it to go only when it's um, trying to find the micro switch. Um, normally, I want it to go that way. So I just reverse the output. In fact, if we have a very quick look at my code window again, you'll see that. When it reads the temperature down the bottom, uh, here we are, look. The mapping value it returns back has got a minus in front of it. So that I don't want to move it to say, well, like now, 1024. I want it to move to minus 1024 from its known uh, resting point of zero. Zero here. I want it to go minus 1024 that way. So that's... Uh, clockwise from my point of view, but from the motor's point of view, that's going backwards. I think that just about covers it, really. If there's anything of interest that I've still got on my browser that I haven't shown you, I'm going to add in links and maybe add some blurb around it in the video down below. In fact, just before we leave the topic, I've powered the device now with my little um, power bank here, which is only 5 volts, but the 5 volt is plenty enough to turn this motor with this little pointer on it. And we're going to go outside, so you'll be able to see it go up and down as we move, as we move from an inside to an outside place. Already you should be able to see that changing because it's a lot cooler out here than it is indoors. So when you see the little light flashing on here, you'll know that uh, the temperature's changed. It thinks it's 20 in a tiny bit. Now, while we're waiting for this to change, um, it's tempting actually to mount all the electronics here somewhere on the board at the front, sort of maybe over here in a waterproof or see-through transparent case, because um, I have noticed that people like looking at the um, electronics. It's either that or stick it around the back of the board, so that's all a bit oh, no, anonymous. I don't know. Well, anyway, you can see it's dropped a little bit. Now it's now on 20. Well, given that the uh, the DS18B20 is supposed to be quite accurate in its measurement, I suspect it probably is about 28 here. And given that I'm just standing here in my T-shirt, um, it doesn't feel chilly or anything, so it could be 20. Well, if we go back indoors, you'll probably see it go back up again. Let's try that. All right, we're now back in my uh, study. And it's definitely warmer in here than it is outside. So let's see if it actually does anything in the next uh, minute or so and I'll just edit the video to make it nice and quick. There's one. So now it's gone up to 24-ish. There it goes again. Okay, that's good enough for me. Real world example and running on 5 volts too. If you found this interesting and useful then please give me a thumbs up, share it with your friends and colleagues and of course if you haven't already please subscribe. Okay, I know I say it every time, don't I? Okay, thanks for that then. Thanks very much for watching. See you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos interesting and useful. You can leave comments down below and also click that little button that says subscribe. Okay, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.